David Mamet, The Woods. <laughs> I played on this stage, Mallory, <laughs> of the Tarragon Theater, and I was booed. Mm -hmm. I've never been booed in my life. What was it about that production of The Woods that led to that man <laughs> booing us? <laughs> It's a very interesting question. <laughs> Two of our best actors, you and Nancy Polk, and they hated it. I don't know whether it was the time that uh, Mamet was just one of those playwrights no one was used to, or if it's the play. It certainly wasn't the acting. Could have been the direction. Uh, but you're right, probably one of our least favored uh, productions. And what does the office staff do? What does the general manager do when the show report comes <laughs> up saying people are walking out, people are booing? What do you do? What's your role as a Well, GM I take it all per very personally, for a start. I always do. Reviews, I mean, I was constantly being told you can't take it personally, but I do. But then you also get used to it after a while. And if things are rolling, although that was a, that actually was not a good season. Um, you can sort of tuck it away and not worry about it, but sure, it's, it hurts. It hurts, and it hurts financially, for sure. Uh, I always remember Urjo and I sitting, looking down at an intermission of, in another play. Uh, I won't mention the name. And everybody put their coats on and walked out, and we thought, oh, well, they're all going. But at the end of the intermission, they all came back in again. But we were terrified. We thought, they're going to empty the house, and we'll never, we'll never see them again. Is part of your job as a, as a general manager to uh, make sure the morale is, I mean, when the bad reviews mm. are in or people yeah. are walking out at half time, yeah. to the, you have the balance sheet and the morale. Is it your job to go down to the dressing rooms and? Absolutely. I think so. I think so. And, and Urjo used to do it with notes, his beautiful notes that he could, he could write a note if things weren't going well, and it would be enough to, to uh, make people feel better. Bill was a, a booster anyway. And no, I think it is. I mean, I, I suppose that's why, I mean, having been here so long, that was one of the things that I did. And I really, sometimes it was hard because you might agree <laughs> with what's being said about the play, but. So where do you put that personally if you have reservations, well, take the woods again, the David Mamet play, that just didn't work. You didn't think it worked, so. Yeah, that one is an odd one because I, I don't know why it didn't work either, really. Um, the play itself has been done and I'm sure has succeeded, but uh, it's the ones that I don't like, which are hard. And Which ones didn't you like? You know, I actually, can't totally say. I, th th I mean, there are plays that, that I love and will go back and see over and over again myself. And there are ones that I, that I don't see but once. And I can't, and, and right now I, I couldn't give you a good answer to that. If I went through that list, I could tell you. But I've obviously blanked it out. Um, you, you just try to keep your mouth shut, except to your closest friends. And then you can say all the things you really feel. In terms of, uh, so there's the Tarragon beginning, doing new works, you know, not doing mm -hmm. the, the safe classics, not doing the tried and true mm -hmm. Harold Pinters, but choosing to head off and David French, David Freeman, Michel Tremblay. How do you sort of, how do you and Bill sort of prepare to take the risks to do that? Well, you know, the, the interesting thing is that I came in the second year and that second year could have killed us because <laughs> everything we did was underappreciated, you might say. And some of the plays were not uh, fully formed yet because they this were new. This was 1972. Oh, in fact, it was the year before. Sorry, what? it was 71, 72. I wasn't there yet. And the, the plays that were presented were all new and they were all a little bit rough and, and didn't please the audience. And that was after our beginning with Creeps. So we had a very good start, and then it was kind of low for the rest of the, the next season until David French right. leaving home, which was the last show 
of the 71-72 season. And we revived it in the fall. So I came in just as uh, the revival was happening. So if the whole, that whole second season had been very flat or bad, would Tarragon have credited? Well, it would have, it would have been a question, I think. I mean, Bill being Bill, probably not. He would have continued. But it might have really cramped the style. And he would have be, had to wonder whether he could do this. And, but, you know, it was, it was the saving of us. I mean, bless David. <laughs> he, and then we, we revived it and went right on. And Hosanna came along. And I think after that 72-73 that, um, season, we well, were when you say it was a road. saving, do you mean it was the financial saving or just the amount of people it walking just, in the door or the, or the critics or the critics, the, uh, the critics for sure, and with a lovely critic like, was there a Joe around? He must have done that. Um, people who really knew what they were talking about when they wrote. Um, and also the audience. They, they, they believed in us. And who we, were and your we, audience? I think... I think it was probably, who was the audience back then? It was probably the university crowd, the, the, because actually when you look back, a lot of these people were older. I mean, Bill was in his 30s. Uh, I think Ken Gass was not that young. Martin Kinch wasn't that young. People who started the theaters were not kids the way they are today. I mean, there are 26-year-olds starting theaters now, but I don't think these guys were... They'd been, they'd been out there. Even Paul Thompson, although he wasn't at Passamurai yet. Um, and so with their crowd of people, and it was, it was that whole notion that suddenly there was something happening in Toronto besides you know, just big square block buildings. And uh, you and never when, know who they are. When Bill started Tarragon, was that on a lip grant? I think it probably, there was certainly lip grant money. For sure. I think the difference between Bill Glasgow and the rest of them was that he had friends that he could call on, he had, you know, some money of his own, and it was, it was, there's no question about it, we were, we were lucky in that respect, that we didn't have the same really uh, gut-wrenching problems about money that some of the other theaters had. And I think having a building was just the stroke of luck. This was a cribbage board factory. No. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody says it was a cribbage board factory. We found a cribbage board in the building. <laughs> and I think that's how it got started. I don't think it was ever a cribbage board factory. And I know what it was. It was a building that was built during the Second World War. And it was built with steel beams because it was doing work that was war related. And it was making lenses. And I think on the ground floor, it was actually um, making some kind of engines or something. So it, it turned into a building that did a lot of things. We had a film company. When we moved in, we had a film co company, Insight Films. We had a, uh, an air conditioning firm. We had a color lab. I mean, we were just one of like five different firms in this building. And how did Bill choose a building beside a railway track? Well, it was up for sale. And this is a very funny story. He had a friend who uh, turned out to be, be somebody quite important uh, up in the Yukon. Um, they heard that the owner of this building liked, I think it was martinis or something. So they mix, mixed up a batch and they went to her house and they... Um, sort of bribed their way in the door. And eventually, they got the, the rental of, of the building because they were selling it. It, it, was a, it was a building run by a couple who had great dreams. And when we arrived, there was in what is now our costume storage, an entire um, sort of uh, machine that was going to be like a Max Milk. It was going to you know, spit out things if you gave it money. Um, but it just sat there. I, I don't think he ever got anywhere with it. So I guess they figured that they'd sell the building. And uh, so we just moved in, and we moved into the front part. Right. We Which had, is what the theater is now, and the foyer? The theater, the f half of that, 
half of the lobby. Right. That was all we had. Up here, we, we had a little bit of this room, actually, but not all of it. Probably that half. And, um, I mean, and we had, to, we, we had the uh, Insight film over on the other side. Our shop was on the second floor. But we finally, we, we dug down and lowered the floor. So you see, it could have been even <laughs> less noticed. space in the, in the big... I think we got yeah, a, yeah. at least much <laughs> yeah, we just, more, yes. yes, and down there under the risers, there's a whole bunch of names sort of carved into the cement, <laughs> which someday someone will find. Um, but what was interesting was that uh, in, I think it was, we, we, we bought, we, we, every time somebody moved out, we tried to move a little further. And we, we extended the building and we took over that uh, space, which is now the extra space. So we had two theaters. And that was a big change for us. Uh, and when we got to 1987, and I, I credit David Silcox for this, he was one of the deputy minister, I think. And he said, you know, you should buy your building. It'd be a lot cheaper if you bought your building. And I thought, okay, let's see. And we were paying quite a large rent for this building. And we got a grant from the ministry and we bought the building and we renovated the building and lo and behold, it was cheaper. The mortgage we were paying was cheaper. I mean, we literally saved money by buying this building. And we bought the whole thing. We still left a number of people over there. The, How much was it? We got just under 500,000. I think it was about a million two or something. 1987. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And uh, uh, then, we, then we continued and we kept when people would move out, we'd take over. And, and eventually, we had the whole building. And then we decided to renovate it. And I love this one, because we renovated it. I, I guess maybe it was in the, the first renovation. Uh, it was with, with a bunch of visual artists who, on the side, did reno work. So it was Mark Gomes and a whole bunch of really good artists who were in here renovating our building, which just seemed perfectly uh, the right thing to do, and they were great. They were they were very good, and they knew exactly what we wanted.